I'm just gonna keep. I'm just gonna say random things until you sort this out. So, uh, how y'all doing? Um, was the eclipse great? Did everybody? I hope you all wore your gla- the protective eyewear. Uh, we all enjoyed it. Are we good? I mean, I'm not echoing. Is it? Okay. All right. Okay. So I think we're ready to get started with lunch and learn today. Um, I'm Jennifer Vanette. I'm the Outreach Coordinator, and it's my pleasure to host uh, these Lunch and Learns. Um, just a couple housekeeping announcements. If you need a restroom at any point, there is one just outside that back door. And then there are, of course, refreshments, coffee, I think the little peanut butter crisp things. I love those things. So <laughs> save me one. Um, at any point, if you want a little nibble or a little cup of coffee or something, feel free to, to get up and head back there and grab something. Um, you're welcome to do so. Um, our next uh, presentation type event, it, oh, well, actually, I shouldn't skip over that. Tomorrow, actually, it won't be a speaker, but if you're interested in historical documentaries, we have our midweek matinee at 1 o'clock. So from 1 to 2.30, you can see Settling In, Immigrants and Cultures that Built Mid-Michigan from Delta Public Media. Um, we just do up a little bit of popcorn and play the, play the show. And so it's nice and casual. Come on over if you'd like to have uh, participate in that. Our next speaking presentation is our History After Hours, our evening program. Um, that will be Thursday, April 18th at 5.30. And you would actually be coming to hear me speak about um, shaping their community, Black Americans in East Saginaw. Um, this is based on a book chapter I'm writing uh, for a contribution to a larger book project. So I'll explain all that if you come to that. And then on April 23rd would be our next Lunch and Learn. Um, and we have Christine, e- I can never say the name, I'm, I very much apologize. Eckerly, Eckerly, Eckerly. I got to learn that by this time. <laughs> I just had a lovely chat with her yesterday too. I'm so sorry. Anyway, she will be here to talk about the Rear Range Lighthouse um, and its restoration project. So that will be very interesting. Um, And today, without further ado, I don't know that he needs any long introduction, Um, a a long time um, member working, well, working in Saginaw in historic preservation and history and sometimes known as our walking encyclopedia of all things Saginaw history um, and just all around great guy, chief historian, Tom Trombley. Thank you.
Does this work better? Can you hear me okay? Am I speaking too loudly with the microphone on? No. And I just called it, that was a Freudian slip. I looked down and saw foam and said microphone rather than phone. So, uh, to start out again, um, so the Women's National Farm and Garden Association, the Saginaw branch was formed in 1929. Um, but this is actually um, their chapter, um, their chapter stationary, and I don't know if you can see it clearly, but this is probably from the early 30s. It's unused stationary, but right on the front of it, on the cover, it says Mrs. Frances King, who was the honorary president. She was the first president of the national organization. Um, who has heard of the Women's National Farm and Garden Association? Okay, several have you had have, some of you not, but they um, are very much still a very active organization throughout the country, the Saginaw branch, and I think that the, the name is deliberately, is very active, um, active, and uh, their national president at the time was Mrs. Henry Ford, um, which sometimes becomes a more important part, but um, and this is just a story from their archives, the library, Hoyt Library and the local history per collection preserves their archives. But the Women's National Farm and Garden Association was organized in January 1914 at Ambler, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. Growing recognition of the interest in this field and the need of an organization of this type had been evidenced by the entrance of women in courses offered by the College of Agriculture in Illinois, Michigan, and New York, by the founding of the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women, and in the opening of the Lothrop School of Horticulture for Women. During a visit in England, Mrs. Frances King, and her name is misspelled there, had become acquainted with and impressed by the work of the Women's Farm and Garden Union. On her return, she brought the enthusiasm which crystallized the scattered efforts of women in several states in a common purpose. Gathered in an old barn at the School of Horticulture, Ambler, which Mrs. King, with Mrs. King were Miss Emma Blakeston, Miss Jane Haynes, Miss Edith Loring Fullerton, Miss Myra Brock, and a few others. I feel like I'm slighting somebody if I don't read all the names. The little group of women who became the founders of the association. The first three are still active council members of the association, and Ms. Fullerton was until her death in 1931. The association was incorporated in 1919. And the Michigan chapter um, came along later. Um, the Michigan division, and it's interesting to kind of think of the kind of time. The group was formed in 1914, um, by someone from Michigan. However, it wasn't until 1926 that the Michigan chapter um, was formed, and it was formed in... Anybody want to take a guess where it was formed? In Elma, on the grounds of Orchard House. And I like to see... I don't know that that's the case, but I like to think that that's one of the apple trees that was formed under, where they met, because they met in the yard. Um, and they said... Um, the first president of the association was Mrs. Frances King, the patron saint of American gardens. Um, if actually, I first became aware of Mrs. Frances King in the 1980s when I was working um, as a volunteer with the Saginaw Art Museum with a friend of mine, Marty Ross, and we met the rings, um, the Clark Lombard Ring was the family who, Mr. and Mrs. Ring commissioned the property. And um, their granddaughter, their son, their grandson's wife, I, it becomes complicated to find the family relation. But when we talked to her, she was very familiar with the history of the garden. But she told us one of the things we needed to look for, consider doing, was republishing Mrs. Francis King's books. And at that time, Mrs. Frances King, outside of, I think, members who saw it on the stationery or histories of the Women's National Farm and Garden Association, really weren't familiar with it. So we, we scrambled to find books. And we did find, I did find one of the men references, but I really, at that time, of the Ring Garden, but at that time, I really 
it was there really wasn't a parent of her really close relationship with Saginaw. Um, Mrs. King, since then, um, has become really highly regarded as a very important figure um, in American landscape architecture and really, um, and really engaging women professionally and avocationally um, in the field of landscape design. But going beyond that, one of the missions of the Women's Farm and Garden Association isn't just about, well, just about gardening is a terrible thing to say because everything's centered on gardening. But it's really um, trying to bring people who live in the country and the city together in a common court cause, but also to bring together um, people of different social statuses, status. Um, in the Saginaw branch really does recognize that in their history. Um, but Mrs. King is our focus here. And which is um, the nine books she wrote, which I've read parts of all of them um, and haven't finished any of them completely. Um, but the well-considered garden, um, and there's Mrs. King in her, um, with Larkspur at Orchard House, a bed of flowers. And it looks like that might be peonies um, at Orchard House. Um, and she wrote under the name Mrs. Frances King, and that is what she preferred at the time. Of course, today we would say Louisa Yeomans King. Um, one of the really great sites locally that's available to us to just understand Orchard House, it is private property. Um, some of us not realizing it myself over on the property, not realizing the funeral home was closed. It was a rainstorm. I always tended to go, and I had always avoided it because I understood that the garden had been covered with um, paved over. So I've been avoiding seeing Orchard House for all the years. I've become more and more interested in Man Mrs. King, and I was driving through um, from the western part of the state a couple years ago, and I thought this is the time, and I, I really didn't expect the scale of the house. It looks much more like a public building than a uh, private residence. Um, and the garden is a very nicely landscaped parking lot, um, but in the rain, sorry, and the funeral home is closed. But um, we're very fortunate that um, the Clark Historical Library has a scrapbook um, from, it's a photo album from Mrs. Mrs. King's um, gardener. And so it gives us a glimpse with other photos what would have been around the house. Um, and you can see there's, you know, you can recognize if you stared at the photo that was coming in, you can kind of recognize the house. I love this chain and post technique. Um, and it, it was the garden, from my understanding and from what's recorded, she did work with some landscape designers, but she was more unlike the rings who brought in a major, in Sagna, who brought in a major landscape designer, she did a lot of the design work herself in conjunction with her gardener. Um, and it's really kind of amazing when you look at this parking lot and to think of how it was once a garden. I don't think I need to talk. The photos do better than talking. Um, and yes, she had peonies in her garden. And that's part of their story that we'll be talking about today. And she lacks the weeds that I'm so good at growing. <laughs> and this is where the parking lot is today. Um, that may be a later photo. This is a postcard. After, um, after her husband died in 1926, Orchard House was sold. It became a Masonic home. And for quite a long time, it appeared, from what I've read, the garden did retain some semblance of its original order. And it, gardens change. I mean, and this was very much, she was an avid gardener. And so she, it was more about the plant sometimes than the overall um, planning of the garden. Tinted photographs, one never knows if the colors are correctly tinted in, but. Um, one of the things that becomes very important in this story 
is really to understand the, the role of women's clubs in the 19th century and the early 20th century that um, if you read our recipe column, you know that during March we really focused on recipes that connected with um, various Saginaw women's club. And you know, this is a case where you know, initially you think that this presentation is going to go to something, just the creation of a beautiful garden and just the creation of personal edification, which is wonderful and per, um, and really, really creating something for yourself. Um, but women's club, just like Mrs. K, Louisa, I, I always vacillate whether I should say Mrs. King, which is what I would call her if I had the pleasure of meeting her, or Louisa Yeoman King. Um, but she very much evolved with her garden, but also along with women's clubs. The, does anyone remember the Saginaw Women's Club? I think if I would have, um, it was still existent when I um, worked here the first time in the 1980s. And the Saginaw Women's Club was chartered in 1893 or 94. And it really became a very important force in Saginaw. And one, um, one that really gave women a, a voice beyond a collective voice warning for un unity and really for public betterment. And it's very important when you look at this, that, and sometimes this is even misspelled when you're reading historic things. Does anybody notice something? Woman. Why do you think that that might be chosen? You know, because I've read it, the answer is so easy. Um, but it is, and I would have never guessed it uh, in a million years. It was to show the importance of the individual about working together in unity. So um, I feel like I'm, it's so it, women's club, so is joining. And it's amazing how often that's misrepresented. The other one that's often that um, members of the Women's National Farm and Gar the Sagna branch of the Women's Fat. National Farm and Garden Association always correct, is when they simply call it a garden club. Um, although sometimes in their PR in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, they actually did use that. Um, but Mrs. King, um, who was born in the East, moved to Chicago, and then came to Elma, became very active in the Elma Women's Club. Um, this is one... Um, I think to, the one for Sagna, we'll see their motto is, well, we'll see in a moment. I can't, don't even remember. But this is a program, a musicale, and the leader and hostess, it would have been at our Orchard House, was Mrs. King. With, um, she, this is just some of their programs. So the program committee, emergency committee, which I'm not quite certain, Department of Work, um, and Conservation and Natural Resources Committee is Mrs. King. Um, the Kings came to Elma about 1903-1904. Um, Mrs. King had been born in the Louisa Yeoman, uh, um, boy, Louisa Boyd Yeoman was born in the East. She, um, her husband was from Chicago, and it was her mother-in-law, and they owned a, a department store and lived in the suburbs of Chicago, and her mother-in-law was an avid gardener, and it's through her mother-in-law she learned um, her love of gardening, um, or pa which would become a passion and a lifelong commitment and vocation. One of the things that's really interesting is how the kings came to Elma. Anybody want to guess why they chose Elma? Well, it's not far off. Um, it's because of the sanitarium. Um, Mr. King had, um, Francis King had health issues, um, and it's not really diagnosed. Some have suggested that it may have been an alcohol issue or it may have been consumption. But anyhow, his, his, so they moved, um, he went to the, he came, or enrolled, but I have college on my mind. 
um, entered the sanitarium in Elma, which is actually directly connected with Emmy Wright, who was from Chicago. He was both the pay, uh, benefactor for Elma College, but also was for the sanitarium. And his son-in-law, Dr. Lancaster, whose name we'll see in a second, was um, one of um, was the doctor there. And at the sanitarium, the whole family ended up moving to, um, to Elma. He recovered and started to become um, active in various business ventures. It would end up being Republic Truck was the one that he started for. But there's a lot of business ventures he was involved, Francis King was involved with, became involved in politics, served in the legislature, if I remember correctly. Um, and this is from, um, I can't remember the year, but this is from a Benjamin Franklin party that they had um, at, um, at Orchard House. Um, Annie Ransford from the Retke House, her grandparents were neighbors of the Kings and lived on the street behind Orchard House. And she has some material that she shared with me, um, including a, a letter to her, her um, I think this is to Annie's aunt from Mrs. King. And one of the things that you can see happening is, as Mrs. King becomes involved in her community, in the women's club, her passion for gardening grows, she's managing this huge, and developing this huge garden, but she's also becoming very interested in natural re conservation of natural resources, in really promoting civic beautification. Um, this is a plan um, that she was um, part of a committee that was the, Le the Civic Improvement League of Alma gave in. It was just a model plan for a household, uh, a modest house. Um, and here is actually a plan she drew herself. I mean, she's not a landscape architecture. She's a self-taught designer and passionate plan person. And this was for probably not a house in Elma, but when the Ellsworths moved, she did a simple plan. It is very closely related to that one. It's not the most aggressive of plan, but you can see how she softened the lives of the house in, in her list of materials. And it it's really um, it tells a story. And at the same time she's doing this, in 1910, she purchases, she not purchases, she publishes her first article in a magazine. And this leads to her writing um, several books, the Little Garden series. Um, and in those books, you know, what are you going to use? The view outside your back window or back terrace. Um, and that leads me back to Mrs. Ireland's comment in my first reading of Mrs. King's book. And I did finally found, uh, find um, the one mention of the garden. And she said, there was too much, she said, in a fine garden in Saginaw, Michigan, designed and planted by Mr. Charles A. Platt, balance is preserved and emphasized in a striking fashion by the use of plantain lily. Um, with its shining yellow-green leaves, masses of this formal plant are here used as an effective foreground for a single fine specimen bush, not very tall, of Japan snowball. The poker flower, Tritoma, uh, I won't try the Latin, um, is also used in this garden to carry the eye from, the point, from point to corresponding point. And speaking of Tritoma, which Mr. Platt in this garden associates with iris, and then she goes into another story. But um, so that's kind of was my introduction to her. And it does match the planting plan, so I was very happy. But um, what I've since learned is not just the development. Um, this is 1906, where um, Mrs. King um, is giving, I love this story. She was at a, a forestry association meeting, and she was called on to give a paper, um, and she didn't have a paper. And she said, when I, yeah, this is what I've always been terrified of. When I received a communication from Dr. Roth asking that I should appear before the convention, I treated it as a joke, said Mrs. King. The letter was written in Dr. Roth's usual style, and I did not take it seriously. I have not prepared a paper and will only able to give a few 
extraneous remarks. Um, I gave this right after uh, uh, the holiday season in January for the first time. Um, and here she said, there's one thing that I wish to dwell on quite emphatically. Has it ever occurred to you that the yearly Christmas tree plays a large part in the needless destruction of the timber tracks? Every year, thousands and thousands of these are cut, used for an hour and thrown aside, or made into kindling wood. It is a shameful way to treat the babies of the forest. I would recommend that our children be brought up in such a manner that they will not affect them. And that it's important to remember at that time, a Christmas tree was supposed to be a gift to children from, quite often from Santa Claus. So it appeared quite magically in the par parlor. And it, since Orchard House was probably without one, I don't even have to guess the room it would have been in. Um, and it was a gift to children. So it, she's also talking kind of of the customs of the time. Um, and this when she talks about the important work of the Federation of Women's Club. And Women's Club were, were in Saginaw and statewide and nationally um, were federated so that what would happen is that a representative from one club would join with the other representatives idea in Sagna there were numerous, probably 10 to over 10 women's club at its peak in the early 20th century. And the Federation would then arrange for events and common interests and common causes could be pursue, pursued. Um, and this one during the, uh, during World War One, she um, created the farm a, f a labor source for getting women out to take care of the shortage of labor on farms. Um, and she was recognized in her time. I mean, usually we say, you know, people were here today to say we're, they, we're, people aren't recognized, but she was the first woman to, recle to receive uh, the Massachusetts Society's award is George Robert White Medal to a Woman. It was the first time, and that was in 1921. Um, but, you know, the real subject is here, bringing her back to Saginaw, where she was never a resident, but she was very active. Um, and I don't have these in perfect order, um, but really, the, one of the things that happened, and it, it appears to be a, a little transactional, um, the kings became very, um, very much part of the Saginaw um, kind of business groups in Saginaw. Mr. King and Mrs. King are at dinners quite often accompanied by the Lancasters, which remember is Emmy Wright's daughter and his son-in-law. Um, and so here they're at a dinner um, for 28. Um, and that was um, at, I can't remember who's home, but nothing like not being able to read what you put on the screen. Um, <laughs> And here, there's just another one where they're there. And so uh, these social columns really do tell. Um, very early, they become friends with the ring, with, Clark, Mr. with Lizzie Merrill and Clark Lombard Ring and their family. And it's just about the same time as Orchard House is being constructed. The rings have completed their garden in Sagna by Platt. And you can really... Um, you can speculate, there's no documentation, but you can see that this common interest, if, if maybe some of their original contacts in Saginaw were purely um, business contacts that became social and business contacts, I think in the ring she really found a common, uh, a common love of gardening and probably was very impressed by the garden, which was on a larger scale even than the one at Orchard House. Um, and here... It describes them attending a buffet luncheon at the Ring home. Um, the Ring's daughter, Mrs. Garrett, was married in 1911 in the house, and it was a very, um, a very elegant, elaborate affair, but very, uh, a very small guest list, and the out-of-town um, members, and most of them are our relatives. Um, it includes the kings. And for those of you who are familiar with the art museum, 
this is um, this is the dining room set up for a wedding, and this has not, well, it has everything to do with garden because the house and garden were designed by the same person, but um, the linens and silver were collected on a trip to uh, their travels in Europe the previous summer. The newspaper noted, um, and you know. The kings, not only, they didn't have a house in Saginaw, but if they wanted to entertain, they were members of the country club and would entertain at the country club in Saginaw. Um, Mrs. King, uh, Louisa Yeoman King, was a frequent speaker at the Saginaw Women's Club. Um, let's see, I don't, oh, here it is. The club's motto for the Saginaw Women's Club formed in 1893, in essentials, unity in non-essentials liberty, and all things charity. Which I think is such a beautiful, um, beautiful sentiment. And you can really see, um, you can really start to see how, these are formal papers. I, I'm, the presentation I'm giving today would not meet the standards of the Women's Club. These, it would have been a formal paper, very carefully written, very carefully timed, very carefully presented. Um, and the subject matters are hardly frivolous. Um, the aims and principle of the Consumers League, which is not simply about a certain, um, if you're not familiar with the Consumers League and their white label, it assured that the products were properly made, but more importantly, that they were made um, in, in really just conditions, I'll say, um, that the workers were properly paid in properly, um, that there was adequate lighting, the factories were safe. Um, and the arts and crafts movement, um, and the seamy side of labor or, or was the title, the conversation. Um, and by, this is by 1914, by the first, after the publication of her article, we find in the Saginaw Papers, and nationally, it's when Mrs. King starts to move out to lecture, and here she's lecturing, um, uh, she, it comments, she's um, president of the Na Women's National Agriculture and Horticultural Society, which is, is at the time the Women's National Farm and Garden Association. Um, and it talks about her, um, her, her lecture, which is Color in a Michigan Garden at the YMCA. Um, and... Of course, this brings us to 1919, and all of us know what April is this year, don't we? It is the centennial of the official designation of the peony as Saginaw City Flower. Um, and, um, and Mrs. Uh, what I love when I found this article, um, and you can see how I cheated, I searched by keywords in the paper, things that were formerly unavailable are now, you just have to be creative. I'm afraid we, our whole team has become obsessed with this, haven't we? Um, certain require, and she set down um, the requirements for, this, for the first peony show. But what I love, um, peonies are to be, to be in any one exhibit, and the receptacle in which they are placed, no matter what their shape or color, no, are to be covered with white tissue paper. So... Think of what the consequences of that are. It means the judges are going to be judging your blossom, not your cut crystal vase, or better at that time. Um, of course, um, you know, it goes two ways, the road to Alma. Um, Grash, it also, you can go to Grash. Grash, it can bring, mit, or the train to, or she sometimes took the train for her lectures to Saginaw, but she can also... Um, means that she could open Orchard House to the people of Saginaw. Um, and this just describes her, um, the visit to, of Saginaw people. Um, and it's at this time that the Women's Club, which uh, the Saginaw Women's Club, really, the garden department really rises to, its, uh, to the forefront. The garden department was, and the garden department we would say committee today, um, but was described as the most, uh, the strongest and the most effective of all the committees. And the garden department really decided to move forward with 
the idea of, civ of encouraged city beautification. And one of the things that they did really are to hold flower shows. Now, flower shows may seem like an odd way to encourage civic beautification, but the idea was really to public engagement and really to reach out and get people involved. Um, and this is an article in the Board of Trade where they describe their flower shows. And Mrs. King was very much part of those. And I'm certain a guide, you know, the, I've read the minutes for the Women's Club Garden Department. We have a lot of material. I read the newspaper articles. Uh, but there's that part that we really don't know, those conversations and that cro really cross-fertilization of ideas. But she was very active in um, the Peony show um, at Tom, various in Saginaw. Um, and here she would, um, this one was told, hold at Tran Tanner's Dry Goods, which was on Baum Street. Um, no, Franklin, excuse me. Um, but you can see um, where. It includes a uh, address by Mrs. Frances King of Elma, the subject, the growing peonies. Um, and this just describes just how um, it, the event went. Now, it wasn't um, the garden department I mean, I'm a peony fanatic, and I will admit that I always skew the story, but that's the one they chose as a city flower, however, to promote as a city flower. However, the garden department, you know, they recognize you need to have flowers blooming all year round. So they had a gladio show, uh, Irish show, tulip shows, um, and this is the 1921 gladiola show. And notice, rather than tissue paper, Every flower is displayed in a milk bottle. This is the lobby of the Mecca Theater. It kind of joined into, well, anyhow, if you want a description of that, see me afterwards. <laughs> um, and I love this. Um, I, I do not, I cannot find a photograph of it, but there is a, uh, there is a, there is a gladiola named after Mrs. Frances King. Um, in color, it is a light scarlet of a very pleasing shade, which attracts attention at once. Flowers measure four to five inches, price 10 cents each, 80 cents per dozen. And it was available in Saginaw from the Hayden Saturday Market. Um, and this just describes um, um, Mrs. King uh, attending the show, she arrived and she's described as the country's great flower, one of the great flower lovers. Um, the this, this story, so you can kind of see her connections building to Saginaw, her husband's connection in business through Emmy Wright and the Lancasters are very tied to Saginaw. Um, I know that we have wedding books that they gave for Saginaw people. They gave wedding gifts for. Um, but one of the things, when I initially became aware of her involvement in um, uh, her writing about the Ring Garden, the one book I didn't find at that time, and this is in the 80s before the internet, and we didn't have even really, there hadn't been much research done in Mrs. King. And the one book we missed was the Little Garden. And what I just found a few months ago was um, this garden publication, the Little Garden would contain photographs of Saginaw Gardens. And this is just reinforcement with that. Um, but I'm going to back up. A few years ago, it was probably mm, about eight or nine years ago, um, we discovered in our archive of Saginaw Women's Club material, we found a photo album that contained photographs of Saginaw Gardens. And then, as we did further research, we discovered they were the images that had been used for the basis for a presentation um, on April 4th, 1921, describing um, Saginaw Gardens. And it was two presentations, ornament in a garden, um, using decorative features, and the design of Saginaw, Saginaw Gardens. Um, 
But what we didn't, and that is available on the museum's website. So even if you didn't listen to me today, if you take that away, you can look at that. But what we didn't realize when I started, when I finally got a copy of the little garden, the images that were used in that lecture that we have original prints of were also, several of them were included in the little garden. Um, so I've matched up a few of them. Um, so we have a real copy of the little garden now in the collection. Um, and just to reinforce it, this is the cover, another reinforcement that it contains it. Um, the introduction to it, this is Mrs. Benjamin Farmer's daughter. Um, the farmers, Mr. Farmer um, was a teller at the Bank of Saginaw. Thank you, Kaki, for your help on the genealogical part of that. And um, Mrs. Farmer um, was a avid, very avid and so involved in social causes. And this is one of the things, I mean, I just want to point out I featured photographs of a very grand garden that Mrs. King developed in Elma. But she was also very interested in the idea that gardening was something that brings people together. And it wasn't simply for a status symbol that food, vegetables, for food, which would be vegetables, I've made a third category somehow, um, and, and gardening for color are all, and pleasure are all part of the same thing. And it's really that connection with nature, not having a Christmas tree. It, it, it's all part of a common story that brings people together, but also really advocates and creates um, a role for women, for actually for employment. One of the things the Women's National Farm and Garden Association had were farm side gardens were actually uh, roadside um, stands were vegetables and food could be sold, but also where um, handicrafts could be sold. So this is a photograph of the, of the Benjamin's daughter and one of the several good reasons for the little garden. And this lot that this house is located on is incredibly small. So the idea that, um, that it would be featured in a garden book is really quite amazing. And the other one, this is the, uh, this is the farmer's garden. At least these two are. I don't know. These aren't that carefully done. And this just shows where it's located on Sheridan. So you can see this is not a very, um, see, yes, yeah, this is, yeah, it's right here. So it isn't a very big lot. And I haven't covered half of a lot with that. I put it at the property line. Um, and it's just a little illustrations. Um, of course, in the, the program included guard, um, the Rings Garden. And you notice, there's the photograph. This is the one that was included in the women, in the presentation at the, in 1921. This is from the Little Garden. Um, this is where the Rings Garden, the Sagan Art Museum is now located. Um, and here, I love this. I mean, she's gone, um, she starts out, um, I cannot conceive of the suitable introduction into any monumental material as marble. And the bench is marble. So she then said, aside from taste in such matters, one cannot really compose oneself readily upon a seat whose temperature and shade in our cool climate is always low. Cushions must be at hand, and cushions are a nuisance. After this diatribe against marble, I shall seem inconsistent as I call attention to the charming picture opposite. But here the marble seat is, entire, is in entire harmony with the lines and spaces of the garden of a fine Georgian house. And it is not alone in one or two placed in relation to each other on either side of a straight walk leading into the garden and such on a much lower level. This is an example of the good use of a marble seat. Such use, I still maintain, is rare. The same arguments would hold for concrete as material for garden furniture. These would have been on the main terrace, and actually their grandson had them in the 1990s. Um, this was the house adjoining the Rings home. 
Um, and their garden, the house was actually, um, she was the secretary, Mr. Ring's secretary. And this is, so this would be immediately to the north. And you can see how it probably connects back to the wild garden behind at the Ring's home. Um, and this is on the late, this is Mrs. George, um, George Boyd. She was Mrs., uh, she was George Morley's daughter, um, Letitia Morley. And it was her parents' home that had been extensively reworked in the late 19th century. And then in the early 20th century, she created a very beautiful garden in the borders of Lake Linton, largely per, we know of it through these photographs. And you can see. And just give you an idea of Lake Linton. And interesting enough, I mean, it really, when her parents had constructed the home in the late 1860s um, or early 1870s, Ojibwe Island would have been, was called the Middle Grounds, was a place of working sawmills. So probably her parents had tried to screen out the bayou behind their house as much as possible. Um, in the early 20th century, with the move forward, it really becomes um, a place of really a great feature for their garden. And I just need to point out Mrs. King's money came through Republic Truck and tr several other things. And although she may have made, her husband may have made his money through cars or trucks, she really wasn't fond of garages. This is her complaint about garage design. Um, and, you know, she were constantly, it was open um, to the public. Now, Mrs. King, um, Frances King died in 1926. Um, Louisa Yeoman King continued to practice, moved from Elma, moved to New Jersey, um, where she continued to lecture, be active. She developed a new smaller garden. Um, her financial circumstances had changed. She certainly um, still um, had means, but she um, really devoted her life to really promoting um, gardening throughout the country. Um, one of the things she commented on um, was the importance of, um, of one person in Saginaw, and that was Will McClelland. Um, Will McClelland um, was a, an avid gardener, and Mrs. King wrote, let me see if I can find this. Um, she wrote, this would be after, pe about the time peonies um, had been made the city flower, and I'm almost through here. Peony growing, Mrs. King noted, seems to have taken such a hold in the city that a drive through or into it in June is becoming a thing to look forward to. I fancy that some of this general interest in flowers is due to Mr. McClellan and some to C.W. Ward, who I believe is a Michigan man. And McClellan um, was an early charter member of the Women's National Farm, both his wife and he were charter members of the Women's National Farm and Garden Association, although traditionally they didn't have male members. Um, an avid gardener, um, he also, his house would now be under 675 on Jefferson Avenue as you cross. Um, and here he is um, demonstrating he loved to lecture and here he's demonstrating forcing blooms. Um, this is an article by Will McClelland on peony growing that appeared in Farm and Garden magazine, which we cannot get a copy of. Um, and this is a McClelland garden. Um, of course, at peak peony time. Um, and it was really through McQuellen and the um, Saginaw Women's Club that peonies became named the Saginaw City Flower. And the reason peonies were chosen when you go not to the city council proceedings, but the reason they were chosen was to were a flower that could be grown easily by anyone regardless of the sign to their lot. And their goal was to have peonies on every lot. And just a photograph of the peony shows in the McClellan Garden. We just recently acquired a book that really connects us with this story. It's a copy of the Book of the Peony by Mrs. Edward Harding, which is a general book. But what is special about this book is the signature. And I believe it is 
um, is illegible, and my signature is bad, and I can't read this, but I think it is Floyd A. Wilson. He and his wife, he was an attorney, and he and his wife moved to Ann, from Ann Arbor to Sagna about 1910, and they entered and actually placed in some of the flower shows in Saginaw, and they entered the first peony show, and what makes it so special, and I've highlighted in yellow, in 1923, these are the peonies plants that he purchased from the McClellans, and here's his purchases in 1922 through the McClell Mr. McClellan. And it really, and he's kicked off in the book very methodically, illegibly often, but what the peonies he has in his collection. And that's the site where the McClellan Garden would be today. Right under there, the newspaper, when the expressway was going through, um, commented how there was still a couple of lilac, lilac bushes that were standing. Um, and just, there may be a peony named after um, Will McClellan. Um, there's one growing, it was a Shaler introduction, one is in the Arboretum at the University of Michigan. These are some of his favorite ones. And I just wanted to close with this comment view of Bliss Park and where there were peony plantings. And I'm going to quote with one quote. King believed in gardening as a force for democracy, a means of bringing people together, and moreover, for a way for women to establish them, themselves professionally. An ardent suffragist, she was active in the Michigan campaign for women's suffrage and continued her efforts for the advancement of women throughout her career. She helped found the Women's National Farm and Garden Association in 1914. And I won't continue, but um, I just will close with a couple of neat photos. That's Mrs. King's garden. That's, uh, and that is Mikado, which was the first single introduced. Um, it was grown at the Japanese Pavilion at the um, World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. And supposedly all the cuttings that are sold today still come from the roots from the were salvaged after the fair, which I not convinced I believe. So thank you so much. And I didn't realize this is adjustable. Are there questions? It's orchard and if you send me an email, I'll send you the direct direction. I and it's um, I can't remember the exact coordinates, but it's 